Okay, so it looks like numbers of participants is now uh, not going up, although as I say that, two more people joined. Uh, welcome. This is the final event for the Towards the National Collection Foundation project, known as uh, Heritage PIDS for short, but actually the, the official title of our project was Persistent Identifiers as uh, IRO Infrastructure. Uh, live captioning has been switched on, so if that will help uh, any of you with uh, note taking, etc., um, then do please enable uh, visibility of that transcript on there. We are going to be recording today's session and hope to make it available afterwards, as we've done for all of our other uh, workshops and events as well. So uh, if there are any connection problems or you need to drop out, you should be able to catch up with us uh, and colleagues will also be able to access the recording afterwards. So I'm going to get started with a quick summary of how uh, our two hours of this final event are going to go. There is my little part of welcome and introduction before we get into uh, some of the meatier parts of today's session. That includes project overview and findings that I shall be leading uh, along with my colleague uh, Frances Madden, who's been the research associate on this project for the last two years. Um, we will hear from Rod Page, who is a co-I on the project, um, is here as our kind of external to the collections community friendly researcher to give us an, an analysis of uh, how he has seen the project and the work to be done uh, across the sector um, that supports what he does. We will then hear from our other partners in the project in a round table. We've recorded uh, that little session also because uh, one of our co co-eyes, uh, Lorna, um, might not be able to make it uh, as she's had a call up for jury duty. So Lorna, if you have made it here, hello. Um, but yeah, we just recorded that to make it a little bit easier in case we're missing anyone. Um, we will then have a 15 minute break before we look at the recommendations of the coming out of the project as we wrap up that we're going into the final report that we deliver to the programme and to the AHRC. Um, these are our draft recommendations and we hope that any helpful discussions uh, and input and feedback that we get from today can go into the report before it is fully finalised. Uh, and we'll also have a panel discussion towards the end, uh, hearing on next steps, how to, how to take some of this work forward uh, within the programme and within the sector. So with that agenda in everyone's minds, um, it was a 21 month project that we originally embarked on to look at the role of persistent identifier use in heritage collections in the UK. We did extend it by a few months uh, for various COVID related reasons and allowing us to work a bit more closely with projects who were uh, more deeply impacted by the COVID situation when we all got um, started off. Um, the British Library has been the lead partner on this project. We've been working uh, with persistent identifiers, specifically thinking about research um, identifiers for scholarly communications for a number of years. And we knew that there were colleagues across the heritage sector who were already using persistent identifiers or wanted to use them. And so we brought some friendly folks together, Royal Botanic Garden, Edinburgh, National Gallery, University of Glasgow as co-eyes on the project, but also working with uh, BNA Museum, Science Museum Group, Natural History Museum, and their kind of needs and requirements and diverse kinds of um, apologies. That's my sister calling me, go away. No, sorry. Uh, that was bad timing, wasn't it? Um, projects, uh, yes, who are interested in persistent identifiers and uh, bringing them together with the aim of increasing use and uptake of persistent identifiers for collections. We saw the benefits that were uh, being found by higher education institutions using persistent identifiers such as DOIs and ORCID identifiers for their outputs for their researchers and people contributing into research and we wanted to see whether the same advantages and benefits could come to the management of heritage collections, including the ways in which heritage collections are used in UK research. What we wanted to do was look at the barriers and the opportunities and deliver a set of recommendations as how the sector can move forward with increased use of persistent identifiers to overcome those barriers and to actually realise those benefits. Um, so what we did earlier on in the project when we had a kickoff meeting similar to this we brought folks together in a webinar 
talked about some of the aims that we were hoping to get out of the project. And one of the things we quickly realised is that we needed to undertake some kind of benchmarking exercise to understand where the sector was the direction of travel and so that we could return to it at the end of our uh, two years and see what progress had been made. So if we look at the survey results, we found that just under, we, we ran the first survey uh, within the first six months of the project. We ran the second survey towards the end of last year. So it was a good 18 months in between the two surveys. Um, and we found that just under a quarter of the people responding to the second survey uh, had completed the first survey. So that actually meant it's difficult to make direct comparisons because the cohort responding to both surveys is actually quite minimal. Um, we do see some international representation across both of the surveys though. So it has been heartening for us that in that kickoff meeting um, throughout the various uh, workshops that we've had, we have had quite an international audience. Obviously, our focus has been on uh, folks and collections across the UK. So we do see a high representation uh, in the second bar graph there from uh, England, Scotland um, and Wales. But actually, we have had colleagues from Asia, the Americas and Europe joining us uh, and coming along the journey with us, which has been quite nice to see that whatever progress we make in using persistent identifiers in the UK, we're not necessarily going to be doing this alone. And there's opportunities to link with international collections um, with the works that our peers outside the UK are doing as well. One of the things we saw from this first survey is that awareness of what persistent identifiers were and what the benefits could be was seen as being quite low. Uh, we have seen some increases in this throughout the two years of the project. So the big yellow portion of both of these charts show that there are continue to be some pockets of awareness in the organisations that responded to the survey. But what we can see is that the orange and the blue segments of these pie charts. So blue is that all staff who would benefit are aware and orange is broad awareness across the organisation. Both of those segments have increased and the, the grey portion of low or no awareness has slightly shrunk. Um, this is percentage wise rather than absolute numbers because we did have a slightly lower response rate to the second survey. But it's, uh, it's positive news for us that staff who need to be aware are becoming aware of persistent identifiers and that broad awareness is also increasing. And this is also borne out through looking at the barriers that people report to seeing in uh, use and implementation of identifiers in heritage organisations. In survey one, which is the chart on the left, awareness was really the biggest barrier that people were reporting. And coming into survey two towards the end of last year, that is now in third place and actually resources and technical issues and ability um, are actually now the top barriers that people see for use of persistent identifiers. So to some extent, the project identifying awareness as the key barrier to overcome and starting to overcome that has actually happened within the time course of the project. And we hope that this can continue on uh, beyond uh, today as well. One issue that still remains is about getting this awareness and the benefits of persistent identifiers through to actual decision makers. So the people who are in charge of the resources and the technical capability, if you like. Um, and I think that is an area that we will need to continue to address going forward beyond this project as well. And we'll talk about that um, towards the end of the session when we look at next steps and recommendations. So then when we look at the work that we have done in the project in producing what we've set out at the beginning to produce, which is a toolkit for people to start working with persistent identifiers and then, you know, going towards implementation, the outputs that we have from the project that go into that toolkit were have been already actively used by half the respondents to the second survey, which is really nice news. And actually all of those who had looked at um, any of those outputs, when they have done so, they have found them at least somewhat useful or very useful. Nobody had reported that any of our uh, outputs were not at all useful, which is uh, a relief. We don't see any blue uh, on that graph to the right. 
And actually what we can see is that the PID demonstrator has been uh, particularly useful out of all of those. So thank you very much to Rod, um, who'll be speaking later for producing that PID demonstrator. I think it really helped on top of the case studies, give people, as it says on the tin, a demonstration of the ways you can link content and collections together using persistent identifiers. Um, and we also had towards the end of the survey, some free text responses for people to tell us anything they wanted to. And we did have a few uh, comments as noted here, kind of thanking us for the work that we've produced during the project, which, is, which has been a nice outcome um, to get from the survey as well. And this is where I hand over to my colleague, uh, Francis, who will talk about some of those outputs in a bit more detail. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I was wondering, did you want to do the Mentimeter now or? That is a very good point. I'd forgotten about that. Um, I just jumped straight into it and uh, neglected to give myself a chance to do the Mentimeter. So any of you who have uh, come to our workshops before will have used this and maybe other workshops held by others. Um, in a browser on your computer or on your uh, smartphone, if you go to www.menti.com, as you should be able to see at the top of this slide, input the code as requested. Um, we're going to get you all to give us a little bit of live feedback. We can't see uh, your strange PowerPoint. Oh, you're, yeah, sorry. It's um, almost been a whole month since I have last done one of these and I've already forgotten how they work. So thanks for the reminder, Francis. Um, can, you, can you see that now, Francis? Okay, good, I'm getting nods. Um, apologies. So the code you can now see uh, at the top of my screen share, 7381. 1998 and if you click the thumbs up that should be near the middle of your screen uh, we can see when you've all managed to get it loaded and working so we have got uh, 47 people on the call um, if we can get those thumbs up into at least a 30 then i will move on um, as a reminder in a browser um, on your phone, on a laptop, on whatever other device you have, www.menti.com, and then enter the code 73811998. That will remain on the screen as we go through into the actual questions. Um, so we've got up to 30. I will move on to our first question. Um, and just for us, not letting me go forward. There we go. Um, get to know you all that have joined us today. Please let us know where in the world you are right now. So I mentioned in the survey and in other meetings, we've had good representation from outside the UK, but also across the UK. If you want to be uh, more granular and tell us specifically where in the UK you are, please feel free to. Um, yeah, welcome to everyone. Welcome to colleagues from Italy and Belgium, and Germany. The Lake District sounds uh, like it's a very nice place to be uh, right now. I'm jealous of whoever that is. Um, Plumstead is pretty much uh, across the river from where I am in Dagenham at the moment. So welcome. Lovely. Um, it's nice to have you all with us and apologies for anyone for whom this is a particularly bad time zone, but I don't think it is. We have had colleagues join us from um, Iran and Australia previously on these calls and they must have stayed up a bit later to, to join them, which is dedication for you, I think. Um, so moving on to the next slide to get uh, to know you a little bit more, how would you describe your role? This is one of the questions we had in the survey as well. We had lots of representations from people working within technology departments across heritage organisations, as well as curatorial roles, preservation roles. Um, we also had folks responding to it working in estates as well, which is really interesting. 
I think uh, in some of our heritage organisations, the link between the collection side and estate is a lot closer than it is uh, here at the British Library, for instance. It's nice to see that we do have uh, some senior management uh, managers in today, uh, which will definitely help us out with uh, the recommendations about getting uh, decision makers involved in persistent identifiers. Um, yeah, thank you all for joining us. So, I've been talking about the surveys a lot. It would be lovely to know from you all um, if you actually responded to any of our surveys. It's interesting that there hasn't necessarily been a lot of overlap um, between people attending these sessions and doing the survey, as we can see right now, uh, live on screen, that we had quite a few people who didn't complete either survey. But that's not a problem because we're going to, uh, we've already told you a bit about what we found. Okay, all right. Um, I think the next question is probably going too far. I'm going to go to it because I've already forgotten what it is. Yes, we will come to that later. Um, so I think I definitely do have back to Francis now. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I'm going to take over sharing the screen if that's okay. Um, so thank you. Um, all for coming. Um, as Rachel said, my name is Frances Madden. I was the research associate on this project for the past couple of years. Um, I'm going to give you a very quick whistle stop tour through the um, project findings and some of the resources that we created as part of the project. Um, I've spoken about these a few times at other events, so um, that's the reason for the brevity. Um, so firstly, we produced four case study reports, um, the aim of which was to help other organisations see what the path to using persistent identifiers could look like. So we focused on four organisations who were part of the project. Um, so the first of these was the British Library, which primarily uses ARC identifiers within the um, digital library system. For, so it's for uh, born digital and digitised resources. Um, these ARCs are created through some bespoke software called the uh, PII or Persistent Identifier Infrastructure and that inf interfaces with other strategic systems. Um, the ARCs at the BL are not globally resolvable, um, unfortunately, so you do have to know that they come from um, the British Library. And of course, because of um, them being implemented just in the digital library system, it means that quite a lot of our collection doesn't have um, have a persistent identifier. Um, some of the other PIDs used at the BL include um, DOIs, ORCIDs, um, the library is also an ISNI registration agency. And um, in response to this case study um, and the kind of findings of sort of how long these um, identifiers have been in use, some since 2012, we've developed a um, persistent identifier policy to make sure that we have a coherent approach as um, we go on to um, upgrade systems in the future. Next, we looked at the National Gallery, which is using um, linked open data dereferenceable URIs. And um, this has been developed in beta and is now being transitioned into a production system. Um, the rationale behind this approach was to um, use middleware so you can um, use persistent identifiers to um, make sure that um, updates, um, you update information in one place and it gets pushed out to all the other locations. And um, the National Gallery also um, include um, identifiers for other um, externally created entities such as DOIs for journal articles um, in, in their collection management system and that's sort of ongoing work as part of um, a project to um, make more information about their collection available online. An update from last year as well is that they, um, the National Gallery now has created ARCs um, using those URIs which are globally resolvable via the N2T resolver. Um, next we have the Natural History Museum which um, their, I, the identifiers there sort of break down into both in, internal and external identifiers. Um, the internal identifiers, they are 
working on, particularly as part of a data model that, um, that's um, in development for um, a new collection management system. And they also want to be able to manage complex objects as part of that. In terms of external identifiers, they use GUIDs um, on the data portal, which um, is sort of compatible with the CTAF stable identifier scheme. They also use DOIs for data sets and ORCIDs for creators and contributors. Um, some observation about the Natural History Museum's uh, use of PIDs is that it sort of very much comes out of the fact that the collection is huge. So they're, um, they've digitised 5 million items um, out of 80 million that they're working towards digitising. And the collections are very heterogeneous, have been managed very heterogeneously over time. Um, also, as a scientific publishing organisation, they've been quite driven by um, some of the changes to sort of open scientific practices and publishing practices um, from the past few years, and also as a member of DISCO, and um, that's um, influenced them as well, um, which you'll hear a little bit about more about soon. Um, finally, we have um, the Royal Botanic Gardens Edinburgh, um, who use um, barcodes and um, CTAF stable identifiers. So they were able to use the barcode in the construction of their um, online resolvable ID. Um, they don't have any historical numbering schemes, so they just use barcodes and they've taken the approach of stable identifiers rather than persistent identifiers. So that's where it's guaranteed, the persistence of the identifier is guaranteed by the, the institution rather than by any third party service. And they are um, also doing a huge amount of work to integrate PITs for metadata entities. So things like all the named people within their um, catalog um, to make sure that they have identifiers associated with them and creating those bi-directional links. So within the registries and in within the catalog that they both have the persistent identifiers in um, there. So just some conclusions about the case studies as a whole. Um, two of them use a middleware to create PIDs and two are using CTAF um, stable identifiers. Um, all organisations of the organisations have to support um, a, quite a wide variety of persistent identifiers in different ways, whether that's just including them within a catalogue or creating them. And guaranteeing persistent definitely definitely does seem to be a challenge and um, so we've got you know stable versus persistent that discussion and then it's definitely more of a human issue than a technical one. Um, it's also worth observing that um, PITs are often implemented to address um, an internal use case as much as an external one so we could see that at the British Library where um, it was very much done to sort of help manage the um, digital collection um, but Sort of designing solutions with that in mind has to an extent limited um, some of the um, external benefits that you might gain um, from it. And um, this sort of repeats what I said on the previous slide, but um, you need institutional buy-in to persist links, whether or not you're using a third party. Um, so you do need to, so the human issue of keeping links persistent remains a challenge and bears being repeated, I think. Next, um, we have Developing Identifiers for Heritage Collections, which is a guidance resource that we created um, in response to one of the um, recommendations from the interim report, um, which was to develop sort of institutional requirements to help organisations understand what they might need from um, persistent identifiers and sort of how um, complex they need to go with it. Um, so to do that, we um, uh, created um, a huge number of use cases within the project. We had a workshop, as you can see there, all got quite messy. And um, we categorised them roughly and came up with these rough categories. Um, the data set described with those sorts of use cases is um, available at that link, which I'll, I'll share all these in the chat shortly. Um, and from that we were hoping to create a table. We've been quite inspired by the idea of five star linked open data as a way to sort of um, conceive this. Um, however, we soon realised that we needed to be able to incorporate a lot more information than a table was ever going to allow us. Um, so we decided to start using GitHub and another tool called UserSnap to gather feedback as well and that would help us manage versioning. So we created this website using the Simple Site framework, which um, Joe Padfield at the National Gallery had developed, who's one of our co-eyes. And um, 
this was our con the version that we put out for consultation in May this year or last year, I beg your pardon. And as you can see, we've sort of had a kind of tried to have a dashboard feel um, and we did various um, consultation exercises such as usability testing with representatives from four cultural heritage organizations. Um, we also received over 20 comments from via user snap. And some of the feedback was that, was that the layout was a little bit confusing, the sort of ordering of those tiles maybe wasn't as intuitive as it could have been. And people did want guidance, which was something we'd always said was going to come in the sort of second version of the resource. So this is just the top page, the top of uh, the home page of the revised version. Um, so another bit of feedback we had was just to present some information sort of right at the start, sort of, you know, what are we doing? What's this resource about? Why do we need to do it? And then below the getting started that you can see at the bottom, there we go, go into the, um, the tiles and the links. Um, as I said, uh, we were, we plan to create guidance and um, the subject matter for this guidance was sort of very much driven by uh, the case studies and the survey results. So we, um, as I spoke about a few minutes ago, we have a piece on there about how to guarantee persistence, um, also around the cost of implementing um, persistent identifiers, um, which was based on, really came out of the survey, then knowing that desire was there, and then also how to implement the different types that we'd identified and um, encourage citations. So in terms of what's next for the resource, um, it's, um, a bit, it's on GitHub, but it's not going to be actively updated um, following the end of this project. It's going to be there though, at least until the end of the Toward the National Collection program in 2025. Um, so we're going to remove the feedback button at the bottom of the page, um, but you will still be able to raise GitHub issues and those can be addressed on a best efforts basis. Um, and the, but the site is available to be curated by others and um, should anyone so wish to do so would be delighted. And finally, I'm going to um, speak about the um, video that we created as part um, of, of the project. And the rationale behind this was to create an accessible resource and um, to demonstrate our findings and to sort of create something that would um, be useful for, for decision makers because um, we'd had some feedback from, from that in the survey that, you know, um, decision makers um, within organisations needed um, some convincing about the value of identifiers. So this was an, an attempt to address that. And um, so we wanted to appeal to a, um, a range of audiences. So we um, we have um, a few of them in there and we also have shorter edits available as well um, to appeal to um, specific um, groups. So if you just bear with me, I will play the video, but I'm just going to make sure that the sound will play. So I think it should. Our museums, galleries, libraries and archives are responsible for safely storing collection items to be accessed and enjoyed for generations to come. But at the moment, many institutions are using different systems to manage their collections. So what is available in one can be hard to find by someone working or researching in another. There is an answer, and it's already being tried and tested in some of the leading heritage organisations across the UK. A persistent identifier, or a PID, is a unique and permanent ID that can be associated with any kind of content, whether that's a person, an object, piece of data or research article. Persistent identifiers are the cornerstone of connected knowledge. If you want to connect information from the British Library to the V&A to the Royal Botanical Gardens in Edinburgh, you need to be able to know how you connect one institution, one object, one plant to a painting that that plant is illustrated in. Persistent identifiers provide the connecting points between one piece of information and another piece of information and if you can trust it and it persists then your knowledge continues. One of the benefits of PIDs is that if the collection management system changes in one institution as long as a PID is assigned the item still remain discoverable for everyone. If we were able to, to create this museum data system then we would create a data lake of hundreds of millions of uh, museum object records that are currently not available 
uh, and you would be able to search across them. And because they were persistent, they would be there over the long term. And the research opportunities are vast. Once PIBs begin to be applied to all sorts of content, it potentially surfaces information about people and places and events that haven't been very well studied previously. And this can be incredibly important for uh, inclusivity and making sure that our research is as diverse and wide ranging as possible. They also make working with data easier for heritage professionals. By bringing PIDs into our workflows, we've been able to make our processes more efficient, more reliable, and to provide a better service to our users. Persistence identifiers help us work out how people are using our collection, which then informs what we collect in the future. And the more institutions adopt PIDs, the more useful they become. The use of PIDs opens up regional, national and international collections and allows us to connect more of the world's data. Has your organisation considered adopting PIDs to manage your collections? Find out more today. Our museums and galleries hold objects which are hundreds and hundreds of years old. Here's hoping our digital content can be used and explored for the same period of time. So that was our um, video. Um, so at this point, um, please feel free to ask any questions in the Q&A. I see we've got some messages in the chat. I haven't um, looked at them yet. But um, what I will do now as well is we have another uh, Mentimeter question. So I just need to find... Do you want me to share that again? I think, uh, I think I've got it here. Is that... Can you see that? No. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, there is. Um, yeah, if you would, if you have any questions, please input them into the Q and A box or into the chat, and then we also um, feel free to um, tell us as well what you have learned or what you will take away from the project. I don't think we've had any other questions in the chat and I was busy uh, when I eventually found the document pasting all the links into the chat so that's been done um, so yes if anyone wants to see any of our outputs that we've produced the links are now uh, in the chat and they're also available via um, the project site as well. Thank you for all of these comments. Um, it's nice to see that the sort of value of linking content is um, sort of a, is being seen and understood. Um, what I think we might do at this point maybe is leave this question up there um, within the Menti poll, but I'll stop sharing and we can now hand over to uh, to Rod. Um, in, at, at this point, if there aren't any questions, um, is that that's okay? Thanks, Rod. Um, 